Kryptons are a class of molecules that preferentially lock up certain ions, and were once the subject of a Nobel Prize in 1987. They are comparable to crown ethers, but more difficult to produce, and also bind alkali metal cations more strongly. This makes them more suitable for isolating these types of ions. By binding these cations, kryptons increase the reactivity of the corresponding anions in these salts, since they effectively break up ion pairs. The binding of cations by kryptons also makes them more lipophilic, therefore allowing these salts to be dissolved in organic solvents, in which they normally wouldn't. They can even be used to isolate alkalides, for example the stodide anion. The most common and important krypton is 222 krypton, which also goes by the name Cryptofix 222, which preferentially binds the potassium cation. Now there isn't really anything specific I wanted to do with it, but I just like these types of molecules, so let's just see how they can be made. To get started, I set up a flask in a water bath and add a stir bar. Then I add a bunch of ice into the water to cool this reaction. As a solvent, I add 200 ml of dichloromethane and then 45 grams of triethylene glycol as the first reagent. I also wash out the cylinder with some DCM, since the triethylene glycol is quite viscous. And then I touch a funnel and add in 114 grams of p toluene sulfonyl chloride, also called tozo chloride, or shortened to TSCL. I then let this stir for a few minutes to allow it to cool down. Nothing happens yet. And to start the reaction, I gradually add a total of 134.4 grams of potassium hydroxide. At one point, I added it too fast, and the DCM started boiling, but it was contained, though it will reduce the yield, since it should be kept cold. The heat will cause side reactions to take place, but it's not really a big deal. In the reaction, the alcohol groups of triethylene glycol react with tosyl chloride in the presence of a base to give triethylene glycol ditosylate. This is a common way to transform an alcohol so it is susceptible to substitution reactions, aka it makes it easier to replace the alcohol groups which is normally very difficult, since it is a very poor leaving group. What first happens is that the alcohol attacks the tosyl chloride sulfur, causing one pair of bond electrons from a sulfur-oxygen double bond to move onto the oxygen. In the resulting intermediate, this double bond reforms and kicks off chlorine because it is a good leaving group. The following protonated intermediate is easily deprotonated by the potassium hydroxide, forming water, and the hydrogen-oxygen bond electrons move onto the oxygen, balancing its charge. The remaining potassium and chloride ions form potassium chloride. This happens on both sides, giving the ditosylate product. When the addition was finished, I left it stirring for 3 hours, and when I came back, it had become yellow. I then move all of it to a beaker, and wash and dissolve everything with 500 ml of water, as well as 200 ml of DCM. I then move all of it to a separatory funnel, and separate the water and DCM layers. I then wash the yellow DCM layer several times, with a large amount of water which dissolves and takes out remaining potassium hydroxide, salts, and starting material. When all of it has been washed, and the yellow color is gone, I wash the DCM with a saturated sodium chloride solution, which removes the cloudiness by taking out water that is dissolved in the DCM. Then to the DCM, I add some sodium sulfate to absorb remaining droplets of water, and then filter it through some cotton, into a flask. And then set it up for distillation, to boil off all of the DCM. When most of it was gone, I also pulled a vacuum to make sure it was all gone, and then one big chunk of product was left behind. I stab it a million times with a spatula to break it up, and in the end, I am left with 108 grams of the product, triethylene glycol ditosylate, which is a yield of 79%, which is lower than literature, because I added my potassium hydroxide too fast, but it doesn't really matter, since I did it on a large scale. I then crushed the large pieces with a pestle, and transferred 70 grams of the powdered product to a flask, and I have set the rest aside, since we will need it later, I heat the flask and pull a strong vacuum to make sure all traces of DCM are gone, because having a bunch of DCM present can cause an explosion in the next reaction. When that is done, I can start the next reaction. So I add a stir bar, and then approximately 200 ml of dimethylformamide as a solvent. I also started heating it to 80 C, and waited until everything dissolved. Then, I gradually add 40 grams of sodium azide, which is why I removed all of the DCM before. Since having sodium azide, DMF and DCM together can cause the sodium azide to react with the DCM to form diazidomethane, which is a potent explosive. Anyhow, in this reaction, the ditosylate reacts with the sodium azide to form the diazide. The azide ion attacks the carbon adjacent to the tosylate group, and the tosylate is kicked off. 
forming sodium tosylate with the remaining sodium ion. This happens twice to give the diazide product. I left it to react overnight and it has become milky and a bit yellow. I then take it off heat and allow it to cool down to room temperature. When it has cooled down, I filter all of it through a glass fit. The solid residue is the excess sodium azide and the formed sodium tosylate, while the product is dissolved in the DMF. I wash the residue with some more DMF to wash out all of the product. Now I set aside the product solution and we will do a little waste management. Some of you ask me what I do with certain waste. While most of my waste goes straight into a combined horror waste jar, that isn't always possible or the safest for certain types of waste, especially for azide waste, since it is quite toxic and can also explode. So for azide waste, we can chemically destroy it, after which it is safe to dispose of. So dissolve all of the azide residue in water and then move it to a beaker. I wash out the flask with more water and dilute the concentration of the azide to a point at which it is for sure 5% or lower. Then, I weigh out 1.5 times excess of sodium nitride and dissolve that to make an approximately 20% sodium nitride solution. I then add all of that to the azide waste. The beaker is a little too full now, so I pour part of it into another beaker, which I will treat the same way. Then to the combined azide and sodium nitride, I slowly add a 20% sulfuric acid solution. It immediately reacts and produces a lot of gas. The reaction of sodium nitride and acid produces nitrous acid. Nitrous acid immediately reacts with the sodium azide, forming nitrogen, nitrogen oxide, and sodium hydroxide. After a while, it stops reacting, and I add all of the acid to make sure it has all reacted. Now that all of the azide is destroyed, it can simply be added to the waste jar, or poured down the drain if it doesn't contain other contaminants. So that is how you get rid of azide waste. Now back to the DMF solution containing the product, which I have set in a heating mantle. I set up a short path vacuum distillation to remove the DMF. While that was ongoing, it suddenly turned green, and then blue for some reason. When almost all of the DMF is gone, I added some toyween to the flask. DMF is very stubborn, and thus difficult to remove completely. But if we add toyween, and then distill it, it will form an azeotrope with a lower boiling point than the DMF alone. And so it helps to distill off remaining DMF. I do that a few times, and when that is done, it is mostly grey, and the DMF should be pretty much gone. There's still some toyween left, but the product isn't really soluble in it. I then filter it all through a glass fit, but it's still a bit grey, so I wash it with some ethyl acetate, which manages to remove the coloured impurity. I pulled this work up out of my ass by the way, since I couldn't find the full procedure. I then gently scrape off the white powder with a Teflon spatula, while it's still a bit wet from the ethyl acetate, to not anger it too much, since this molecule is a potential explosive. The way we can calculate if an organic azide is a potential explosive is by calculating the ratio of carbon and oxygen to nitrogen. In this case, the ratio is 1.3. A ratio equal or above 3 is considered safe to work with, while a compound with a ratio of 1 or lower shouldn't be isolated. Compounds with a ratio between 1 and 3 can be synthesized and isolated, but should be stored below room temperature, at no more than a 1 molar concentration and a maximum of 5 grams of material. So let's move on quickly. The yield of the diazide turned out to be approximately 20 grams, which is 65%. I didn't see what the yield was in literature, but it's probably better. Now for the next reaction, I add 200 ml of methanol as a solvent and then a little bit of water to increase its solubility. It then all dissolves and as a catalyst, I add 1 gram of 10% palladium on carbon. I then attach a two-way gas adapter and attach a balloon with nitrogen on top and a vacuum pump on the right. I then cycle pulling a vacuum and opening the way to the balloon several times to fill the flask completely with nitrogen and make sure pretty much all of the oxygen is removed. I then replace it with a balloon filled with hydrogen and repeat the same process to fill it with hydrogen and then leave it to react at room temperature with the way open to the hydrogen balloon. In this reaction, the azide groups are simply hydrogenated to amines to form the diamine product. In general, hydrogen will attach to the surface of the palladium that is loaded onto the carbon particles. This allows for the azide to pick up the hydrogens and be reduced to an amine while releasing nitrogen. This is somewhat annoying for this setup though because as per the ideal gas law, one mole of gas occupies the same volume, since for every mole of hydrogen that is consumed, it will release one equivalent of nitrogen, meaning the volume will not decrease, and so the balloon will not shrink like in a typical hydrogenation. This makes it a lot more annoying to track. So instead, I occasionally redid the pumping and filling process with hydrogen to remove the nitrogen again. Another thing is that hydrogen has a lot lower density than nitrogen, and it might mostly stay in the balloon, but I don't really know how gases behave. A way to track reactions like this could be via TLC, but I tried some different eluents to run it 
and I didn't get the ace height and a mean to separate properly. I wasn't about to spend too much time on finding the perfect element, so I just let it do its thing and hope for it to be finished. When it was maybe finished, I filtered it all through three stacked filter papers to remove all of the catalyst. I washed it with some methanol and then set all of the filtered up for vacuum distillation to remove all of the methanol. I then distilled off the amine that had formed, but it's hygroscopic and also seems to be distilling over together with water, so it will be an amine water mix. When all of the liquid is gone, a white solid of the unreacted azide is left behind. I can weigh this azide and calculate from that how much amine had formed. The unreacted azide seemed to weigh about 6.7 grams, which means one third hasn't reacted, but it's okay. This means that the yield of the diamine is approximately 11.5 grams, or about 66%. Now that the synthesis of the amine is finished, I can move on to making 222 krypton. So to the amine, I add 48 grams of the ditosylate that I saved from before. I then dissolve it in about 200 ml of acetonitrile, and add about 20 grams of sodium carbonate as a base. I replace the stir bar to make it stir better, and then set it up for a reflux. In this reaction, two of the ditosylates react with one diamine to form 222 krypton. The mechanism is basically the same as we have seen before, when we made the azide. The amine attacks a carbon adjacent to the tosylate, and the tosylate is kicked off. The only difference is that this time, it has to be deprotonated by the sodium carbonate. I left it to reflux for about 4 days, and when it was done, it had become yellow. I then filter it all through some cotton to separate it from the sodium carbonate. I then distill off all of the solvent, and also distill off unreacted amine. I then add some dichloromethane, in which the sodium p toluene sulfonate and maybe some impurities are insoluble. I filter it again through some cotton to get rid of them, and again distill off all of the solvent. I am then left with a yellow liquid, which I dissolve in a mixture of THF and ethanol. I now set up a small column and fill it with aluminum oxide and run the same THF ethanol mixture through it a few times to pack the column while pulling a vacuum. When that is done, I pass the product solution through the column. This will pull out any sodium that might have complexed with the krypton during the reaction. Even though it prefers to bind potassium, it can still bind sodium. This can also be achieved by boiling it in a mixture of ethanol and citric acid solution. I make sure everything comes through, by passing enough fresh mixture through it. After that, I am left with a solution that should contain the uncomplex krypton. So I again distill off all of the solvent, and a yellowish oil is left behind, in which some solid slowly crystallizes. This mixture contains side products, like some short chain polymers, but they are pretty polar, while uncomplex krypton is also a bit polar. In literature, they say krypton can still be recrystallized from hexane or cyclohexane, so I add some hexanes to it, and stir it which caused all the liquid to solidify into this white solid. I then start boiling it, and add more hexanes to dissolve the krypton. Most of the solid becomes a liquid again, that is insoluble in the hexanes, and stays on the bottom. When it seems to be finished, I take it out, and I decant the top hexanes layer into a crystallizing dish. It immediately becomes cloudy, from cooling down, and tiny particles are separating out. When I left it to cool down, part of the solvent also evaporated, and a bunch of white powder quickly settled out. I then set this up for filtration, and I wash it with some cold hexanes. I let it dry on the filter for about 15 minutes, and I then move it all to a crystallizing dish. Then I am left with 1.9 grams of what should be 2 to 2 krypton, which is a sad but respectable yield of 10%. I also did a rough measurement of the melting point, which gave 70C, so it seems to align with the literature. Anyhow, now that I have the krypton, I can finally lock up potassium salts if they are being naughty.